prosecutor for all civil rights cases and chief of district court and community prosecutions. She is a graduate of Boston College and Suffolk University Law School. Andrea is now the CEO of Ascend Massachusetts, an adult use cannabis company based in Athol, Massachusetts. Ascend cultivates and processes marijuana and has plans to open in three retail dispensaries in the Boston area and in the, as in the process of obtaining additional licenses in Massachusetts, Michigan, and Illinois. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Cabral. Thank you again so much for coming down, Andrea. So my name is Lynn Smith. I am here um, with the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association. And I'd like to acknowledge our board members that are here, Nancy Martin, who is in the back of the room, and Willie Wilson, who is up here in the front of the room. If you don't know us, we're the folks that maintain the little community garden in back of the church. We're also the folks that brought you the little free libraries. And we do a number of programs uh, throughout the year, including, mark your calendars, June 30th, we do the public reading of Frederick Douglass's speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, funded by Mass Humanities. And we are the only community in Massachusetts that reads that speech in the language of our ancestors. So folks can go to the speech online, pick a paragraph, translate it into the speech of the, into the language of their family, and then we read the 45 um, paragraphs. Last year we had 22 languages uh, that we read that speech. So it's really an amazing um, experience. So June 30th in the community garden, douglasbrockton.org. But tonight, we're going to talk about the marijuana industry. Marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, and retail shops and grow operations will now be seeking licenses to operate in Brockton. Tonight's program, just so that we're all on the same page, is not intended to argue the pros and cons of the legalization of marijuana. Tonight's program is, to, is designed to learn more about the industry and to leave at the end of the night as better informed citizens about marijuana operations and the licensing process. What questions should we be asking as citizens, the operators of any proposed establishment in Brockton, not only about sound operational plans and safety and traffic and avoiding any nuisance factor, but also about positive impact plans and diversity plans and peaceful coexistence. So we have invited Andrea, somebody who's well known in the Boston area for her work in the area of civil rights, social equity, domestic violence, prison reform, mentoring, law, public policy, to share her experience and opinions with us this evening as the CEO of an adult use cannabis um, co uh, company. And I don't think you're planning on open, opening in Brockton, so you don't have no. a dog in this uh, fight. So we thought she would be a good neutral person to fill us in on the industry. So the rules of the road for tonight is simple. If you want to ask a question, we ask you to sign in. We'll call folks up one at a time. We have two lists, one for citizen and one for elected officials and candidates. This is not a night for what my dad would call speechifying. Uh, we have a lovely gentleman right here, Mr. Wilson, from his high school teaching days, who has a stopwatch and will time you at two minutes. And when you see the evil spatula <laughs> go up in the air, you know you are getting close to the end of your uh, two minutes. And third, I know that all of us will agree to be open and honest and passionate but we'll, we will not be disagreeable and we will not be disrespectful. So I am going to start with question number one, if it's okay. Andrea, could you please share with us what brought you from the world of law and order and public service to your current position as CEO of Ascend Mass? I generally don't need a microphone. Okay. I, I have one of those voices that kind of carry. Everybody can hear me, right? Oh, because it won't be on the cable. Oh, oh. It won't be on cable. You know, she sprung that on me when I got here. I had no idea that she was going to be broadcasting this. Um, I'll try to watch what I say. I might not be successful. Um, 
I, when I was Secretary of Public Safety, uh, I was still Secretary of Public Safety in 2014 when the regulations for medical marijuana were promulgated. So they were promulgated in another secretariat in the Department of Public Health. And the Executive Office of Public Safety was tangentially involved uh, in them in as much as we reviewed them for public safety uh, issues before they were uh, finalized. And that's when I first became aware of uh, what the regulations would look like. And then in 2017, Attorney General Healy appointed me to the Cannabis Advisory Board. And the Advisory Board is um, the board that drafts and recommends regulations to the Cannabis Control Commission. The Cannabis Control Commission was created by the legislature after uh, cannabis became legal as the sole agency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to handle um, both the issuance and the enforcement of regulations around uh, the licensing of cannabis establishments. So I had been on the board uh, from two, well, for about a year, a little bit over a year, maybe two, when uh, an, a very old friend approached me about being the CEO um, of Ascend, which I, I wasn't really thinking at that time, this, was, this would be last May, in terms of getting into the industry myself. Uh, but this is someone that I'm, I'm close to. He was actually uh, one of the people that was very much responsible for me being elected sheriff in that he was my political consultant when I first had to run in 2004. Uh, and he went a very long way to helping me get uh, elected in circumstances people kind of forget because time passes, but it was a, a very big deal for there to be a female sheriff and for there to be an African American sheriff in Suffolk County that had never happened before. Um, and the political wagons were circled around my opponent and not me. Um, so uh, I had known, the, his name is Frank, I had known Frank from his days of sort of stepping forward and saying, let's get this group together, let's get you elected. And we just stayed friends after that. And he had just formed a send um, with uh, another person who was going to be primarily responsible for raising the funds for a send, and they didn't have a CEO. So I was l literally the third person that joined the company um, and uh, kind of went forward from there. And my thinking on why I did it was in part because you know, it's in government for 28 years. It's very difficult to stop being a good government person. And I realized that the legalization of cannabis is very unique in this country. This is something that had, had, been, had been illegal for all of our lives. There are very few things you can say that about. Alcohol was brought here from the very first people that, that colonized the United States of America. Alcohol was on those boats. You better believe the length of that journey, alcohol was on those boats. Tobacco was here. This became illegal in the 30s, and for reasons that had nothing to do with the efficacy of the, uh, the health benefits of the plant or the use of the plant. It, had to, it was based largely on xenophobia and racism and some economic uh, issues around the fact that hemp was much cheaper than paper, uh, wood pulp for paper. It probably never should have been a Schedule I drug. Um, a Schedule I drug, the DEA schedules drugs, a Schedule I drug is a drug that by its definition, by its virtue of its scheduling, it is defined as a drug that has no medical value, no therapeutic or medical value. Cannabis has been used by indigenous people for centuries, and it has been used for a number of different things, not the least of which is our medical things. That was well known even at the time the drug was scheduled. So it was almost sort of damned at its inception, you know, from the time that it was scheduled. But I understood that with anything that's been illegal our whole lives, people have feelings about it. If you're constantly pushing a message to people that this is a bad thing that they ought not to want in their lives, then people have a tendency 
to just feel that. If it's been illegal my whole life, then it probably should be illegal and there's no reason for it not to be. That's why there are so, we, I say to people only half jokingly, I spend a great deal of my time as the CEO of this kind of company managing people's feelings around cannabis. People have ideas about what they think a cannabis retail place is versus what it actually is. Um, and that has to, you kind of have to bring people around. There's a process to that. And I understood that this was going to be sort of a unique nexus between government and government regulations and the free market, which is what all business is. And that businesses were going to have to shoulder some responsibility to be good businesses, to be models in this industry. Uh, because regulation only takes you so far. Everybody knows there are great businesses, there are good businesses, there are terrible businesses, and there are dangerous, deadly businesses. And a lot of that has to do with the leadership of the company and, and how people see their responsibility to be partners in the neighborhoods where they reside. That's why I said yes to being CEO. That was a very long answer to a very short question. Well, that's okay, because it leads perfectly to the next question. I know that one of the flagship stores of Ascend is going to be close to the North End in Quincy Market. It's 17,000 square feet, 16. Just so that you know, in Brockton, I believe the ordinance restricts the size to 5,000 square feet. And the only restrictions in our ordinance is not within 500 feet of a public school and not within 500 feet of each other. So I'm really interested what you had to go through in terms of dealing with the community, with church groups, with residents, with neighbors, when someone found out that there was going to be a retail store in their neighborhood. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about your interaction um, with the community, hearings, public hearings, and that type of thing? So let me start by saying, um, once Legalization went through. It went through on a ballot question, right? It was not the idea of the legislature and then a bill went through and it went to the governor's office and it was signed. It started as a ballot question. Ballot questions are literally votes town by town as to whether or not something will become legal. When something goes through as a ballot question, there's a lot of local control over permitting. So the rules are, uh, if you're looking to cite uh, a cannabis operation. That can be a cultivation where you're actually growing. It can be a manufacturing license where you're processing cannabis. It can be a retail license where you are selling it. Uh, if you're looking to operate in a city or town, you have to be permitted by that city or town in addition to having the state license you. So it's part of the process. It's a very involved process. The application process is also very involved. It's also incredibly expensive. The building on Friend Street was the first building, the second building actually that we looked at. The first, the first building, um, we're vertically integrated. Let me explain what that means. A vertically and not every uh, cannabis company has to be vertically integrated, but we are. A vertically integrated cannabis company grows and processes, manufactures what it sells. So we're not just, we don't just have a retail store where we're buying wholesale products from someone else. We're growing and creating our own line and brand of products. That's why there was a reference to Athol. We have a cultivation facility in Athol, Massachusetts. The retail facilities that we're permitted for are in Boston and in Cambridge, and we're seeking a third site in Newton. So every municipality, every city and town has its own process for how you get permitted. And the processes can vary wildly. And it was when we first began to be permitted, it was new. Everyone was figuring, Boston was figuring out, how are we going to, going to do this? I mean, there's a regular special permit process that where you go to get a special permit for anything that you want to build. But this was dealt with a little bit differently because it's such a highly regulated product. And there's apprehension. That's the man, sort of managing people's feelings. What is it that we're exactly giving a permit for? What are these things going to look like? So the processes were very slow in, this, in most of the cities and towns. When, when it first started, a majority, actually, of cities and towns actually had bans, outright bans. In other words, we'll never allow it, or moratoriums on when they would start to permit 
um, ca uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, operations. So in Boston, we were kind of feeling our way at the same time. As the city was figuring out exactly what kind of process it wanted to put forward, we sort of went forward instinctually. We started by actually buying the building that we're in. Most uh, cannabis operations rent from a landlord. Um, we bought this building outright because we wanted to establish ourselves in that neighborhood and we wanted to have some skin in the game, right? So it's the difference between home ownership and renting. If you, if you own the building, you're, you're definitely in it for the long haul. It's, it's 16,000 square feet because it's five uh, floors, um, which we're building out in sort of in phases. But it, we, we were very intentional and very um, deliberate about our outreach. And even though there wasn't sort of this full plan that the city had laid out, we sort of instinctually knew that if you're gonna be in any neighborhood um, with something like a cannabis operation, which is relatively new, you need to reach out to everybody. So outreach is the first thing, to me, the most important thing. So it was outreach to the business community and there are usually, in every, in every uh, community, there are you know, business associations, um, there are civic associations that residents are part of. There are individual residents that you go and you end up going to see. We literally covered the waterfront. We went and talked to everyone and anyone. And in fact, for the business association in that area, we probably presented to them three or four times to a select subcommittee or an executive subcommittee um, to, um, I think, a second committee a subcommittee of that committee, and then I think the full uh, the full membership. But we wanted to be really clear about who we were, who we are, and what we were bringing to the neighborhood, and we wanted to exhaust everybody's questions. I mean, it's really the best thing you can do. If you're on the side of being the questioner, anybody coming to be in your neighborhood should answer every question you have. And universally, the questions that get asked, no matter what the jurisdiction, no matter what the process, people want to know about security and presence in the neighborhood. Because that's, that's how they feel, right? Security is the first thing that comes to mind. Is this going to draw an, uh, an undesirable element? And what people kind of don't get initially is, this is a retail store. This is the same, if you've got a retail operation, it's the same as any other retail store. It is selling a product that is regulated. The regulations tell you uh, what you have to have inside that store in order to make it secure. The entire state, like most other states, has a seed to sale tracking system. When a seed goes into the ground anywhere in this state, it is tagged. The journey of that seed to, through its growth through a plant to whatever, however it is processed or manufactured, whether it remains flour or it is manufactured into an edible or a lotion or a tincture or any of those things, it is tracked every step of the way. It is tracked into the retail operation and it is tracked to the point of sale and it is tracked by weight. And the state knows where every single cannabis plant is. And they're constantly looking for a variance in weight because if, if a retail operation takes in a certain um, or cultivation sells a certain weight, wholesale weight to a retail operation, and somehow that's not the same weight that goes out the door, then maybe it's being diverted. Maybe somebody's taking it and the state wants to know about that. And they're really vigilant about stuff like that. And that's the way it is in, in, in a lot of the states, not all. There are some that are actually are very, very lax. But um, in any event, People want to ask about security. What, what does that mean? So we go out and we explain exactly what the regulations require, exactly what we do that's above and beyond the regulations that um, makes it a more secure facility. But more importantly, how we're working with whoever our neighbors are. Um, we've actually, you know, we have good neighbor agreements that we sign with civic associations and business associations. You shouldn't be shy about asking about that. If a business is coming into your neighborhood and there are things that you think they ought to be doing as a good neighbor, 
you should lay those out. That, that company should be coming and sitting down and talking to you about their hours of operation, about um, any of the things that might go on that are just regular business things in a neighborhood that might alter the character of the neighborhood and, and explain to you how they're not going to alter the character of the neighborhood or how they're going to mitigate whatever the problem might be. And those things have to do with traffic. They have to do with parking. Um, you know, they have to, sometimes they have to do with, you know, uh, where your location is um, and that even the needs of the city in terms of needing things like um, a crosswalk or something else in the area to just kind of manage that. They have to have those discussions with you. Um, but they should have those discussions with you. They're not necessarily um, required. But people should be looking to be um, good neighbors. And my first outreach actually was to uh, the captain of the district in Boston where uh, that has jurisdiction over the, the site because I wanted to lay out the security plan and let him know we're going for a permit in Boston and this, I want you to know what our security plan is. Think about it. Give me feedback on it. Having just having conversations is the best thing you can do. And if the company wants to earn its place in your neighborhood, they will sit, representatives of that company will sit with you and have meaningful conversations with you, will not blow off your questions or your concerns, because there are answers to all of those. And, and quite frankly, the application to the state, and frequently the application to the municipality, requires the company to say what their plans are exactly with regard to security, with regard to things like diversity, um, I, I get all kinds of questions. In certain jurisdictions, they're very interested in sustainability and environmentally um, friendly operations, and they want to know exactly what we're going to do about that. You can get any one of a variety of any one of a variety of questions, but all the questions should be answered. So we, as citizens of Brockton, have a challenge because there's not a lot of information for us that's easily easily found. We don't have any frequently asked questions on our city website. We don't have a brochure that says this is where your input. We don't have notices in terms of meetings in front of technical review or the zoning board. So we have to do the work. We have to look in the legal notices, the printed newspaper, every single day to see when a public hearing is being held per the host community agreement. And then we have to show up on a Friday night at 7 o'clock when we really want to kick back and have a brewski to ask our questions. So we all need to be aware that through this process, we have to dig deep to get this information to ask these questions. Because Brockton has been designated as an area of disproportionate impact. And so what I'm going to ask Andrea now is, what does that mean, an area of disproportionate impact? And when the final request for a provisional license goes to the CCC, she, her, her company and any company in Brockton has to include a diversity plan, and a social impact plan. So three things we need to know about. What does it mean to be disproportionate impact? What's a social equity plan? And what's a diversity plan? So the CCC came up with um, the definition uh, or the term, an area of disproportionate impact. There are cities and towns all across, um, I think 20, there were 29 total, I think there probably are more now, but there were 29 total when I first um, uh, looked them up. It goes by your census tract if you're in a very large place like Boston or Springfield. The entire city is not necessarily designated. You literally have to go onto the CCC's website and if you know the street, that you, the uh, location, uh, where the operation is going to be, you can look it up and see if it's um, an area of disproportionate impact. Or, I think in the, you said in the case of Brockton, it's all, the entire thing is designated. Just an area of disproportionate impact is a, it's sort of a polite way of saying, um, uh, in the war on drugs, which is essentially, uh, had always been a war on people who use drugs, where, where in, the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 
uh, were people over-policed and over-prosecuted for drug offenses, and in particular, in particular, marijuana offenses. And that's sort of how they designate an area of disproportionate impact, because the idea when there is, there is some social equity um, provisions built into the regulations, and the idea of it initially was to, uh, and still is, uh, to um, increase opportunity particularly in areas of disproportionate impact for people who were negatively impacted by over-policing and over-prosecution to have an opportunity to get into the cannabis industry. That is much easier said than done because the nature of the industry itself is incredibly expensive and because it is still federally prohibited, there is not even access to commercial banking. That's why you, as you hear about all of this, all the money that's, that basically goes into all the cannabis businesses is private money. It's private equity money. There's, there's, there's literally no other pool of money. You could certainly have a pool of social impact investors, investors that specifically uh, have money and want to invest it and want to invest it um, with a social purpose. They want to attain something in addition to just getting a return on their investment. They want to do good. Um, but they are a, a small portion of the overall sort of pool of investors. Most investors are looking to invest in a business that will do well and do well quickly and will return money um, at a significant rate. And there's only really certain people who know how to go after that money um, and secure it. And so, you know, I think part of what was missing because clearly the intentions are there, the social equity provisions are built into the regulations. The um, Massachusetts uh, created a first of its kind social equity training program that literally uh, invites people who want to be involved in all aspects from uh, ownership to just working in a retail store and provides them training and, and gets vendors to provide them training. I think in hindsight, what the part that was missing was thinking ahead to how you were going to give people access to capital, how you were going to put together, whether they're private, public partnerships, where the state is making an appropriation and it is matched by perhaps social equity, I mean, social impact investors or another pool of investors, a dollar for dollar match or a two for one match, where people can be, can have access to, the, to that money to get started. Um, there, there just weren't enough ideas around that. So what you have are um, the, the good intentions, and I think the genuine intentions, but it lacks a mechanism. Because one of the things the CCC requires is that before you can even apply for a license, you have to have a site. In order for you to have a site, you have to, you have, to have a, a letter of intent with the landlord. And believe me, landlords are charging a, a very high cannabis tax. They know that their properties are, are valuable. You have to pay a hold fee to that landlord every single month while you are waiting to get licensed. It can take months and months for you to get licensed. And that is only one aspect, or that's only one cost, because you also have to have, um, there's a legal aspect to this. You have to know how to do the applications and the permitting. And there are people that get hired to do that just because it is that complicated. So there are a lot there. The lack of access to capital is effectively, in my view, keeping lots of people out of the um, out of the business who otherwise would like to have an opportunity. In part, the I mean, the, for their part, the CCC has now um, is finalizing. I think it'll happen by next February. No. It'll happen this month. It might be, I think it's, I won't, I'll just say this year. Um, delivery only licenses and social consumption licenses, which are different licenses that don't necessarily require everything that's required to do a retail license or everything that's required to do a cultivation license. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of catch up to be had in terms of um, how people are actually going to get access to capital to get into this market. So where Brockton is an area of, um, disproportionate impact, the CCC requires all applicants to file along with uh, a lot of the forms and, and a variety of other things you have to um, let them know about your company, 
narratives around how you will have a positive impact in the, in the location you're going to be in, and whether or not you have a diversity plan for who are going to be your managers, your chief executives, and your workers, what proportions, how are you going to proportion um, your hiring so that you have a diverse group of people working for you at all levels. And you have to make that case to the CCC. Um, so the CCC does look for that, and they really, they have, they just recently rejected someone for a license because their plan for, uh, on how they were going to, uh, their diversity plan and their disproportionate impact plan were uh, insufficient. Um, and that kind of sent ripples through the industry because they hadn't rejected anybody on that basis yet. And I think that was their way of saying this is important to us, and you can't just write, you know, whatever you want down, and, and it's, that's just not going to fly. So for your part as um, folks who are uh, going to be in the position to question a company, you can ask a company, what is it that's in your diversity plan? How do you, how, how are you, what are you telling the CCC you're going to do? How are you meeting that standard? Um, what is going to be the, the sort of general, sometimes it's a startup company, everybody hasn't been hired yet, but what are your plans for how you will diversify your workforce? Why do you think it's even important to diversify a workforce? I mean, you can ask questions like that and you should get answers to those questions. Um, it's, a, it's unfortunate that you don't have the, the you know, a, a site that you can go to that really sort of asks that. You should push for that too. Push for a, a, a portion on the city's website or some other public or municipal website that says what the process is for operators. If I, I mean, operators need to know it, but you need to know it as members of the community too. And knowledge is power. Um, so you should feel free to ask all those questions. But if you go to the CCC's website, they, they do lay out, it's a very um, comprehensive website, they do lay out um, everything that is required and every step in the application process. So you can at least um, educate yourself as to what the company has to do in order to get a state license. Um, it might be a little bit more difficult for you to figure out what they need to do in Brockton, but knowing what they need to do to get a state license is, is uh, that's some good knowledge to have. And I think everyone in the room should be aware that our diversity commission right now is holding hearings because of the 10 host community agreements that were issued in the city of Brockton, which is a majority minority city, I do not believe any of the licenses were given to anyone of color or any women. So that's a question we need to ask our elected officials about how come. But we have to do the work. It's not being handed to us by the city. We have to do the work, the host, the host, HCS. <clears throat> and it's not just Brockton. <clears throat> Somebody, I read an article about a gentleman who said maybe the way to increase HCA issuance to minority <laughs> folks is to bypass the municipal, the local, and go straight to the CCC um, and have a sort of a different track. So we'll see what happens. So we have talked long enough, so we're going to open it up um, to the folks who signed in to ask a question. So Nancy, if I could ask you the first person on the citizen list, and remember, if you changed your mind, if you don't have a question, we'll skip over you. Um, but if, if we can ask the first person, Willie's going to get his timing spatula ready, um, and we will start, and I'll try to repeat the question so that we can hear it on cable. All right, the first person to speak, or rather with a question, would be Larry Fernandez. Okay, Larry, so Larry's gonna skip, all right. All right, uh, next person is Joyce Hill. Where is Joyce? All right, Joyce, I'm gonna... I just have a question. Does the state require money? Do, you ha do they have to pay the state themselves to get a license once they... There's an application fee for uh, if you're seeking a recreational retail license. So when this first started, only medical marijuana facilities were um, licensed by the state. The fees for medical marijuana licensing are exorbitant, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, for recreational, it is much less than that. Um, but it is, I think it's, is it five? 
Is it five or one? I, yeah, I think I think it's five. Um, that's still a, a considerable amount of money. Five thousand. Five thousand. Yeah. Right, because that's the money that the state is taking in to process your license and to pay all the people who 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 are part of that process, um, who work for the state. But yeah, that so that's another another expense that you have to come up with just the filing fee f to apply. Hi. Who determines how many host agreements you can have per town or city? It is, the number is 20, the minimum, not the maximum, but the minimum is 20% of the existing, of the number of existing liquor licenses. So you look at the number of liquor licenses in any particular jurisdiction, 20% of that number is the minimum. Now you can go above that, and, and there are votes about whether, you know, in different municipalities about um, uh, what, how, how many more, in addition to that 20%, a particular jurisdiction might want, but the minimum um, under the law is 20%. So in Boston, that's roughly 51 or 52 uh, licenses. Okay, and does the uh, mayor have to give a host agreement before anyone can go for the license? Does it have to come from the CCC requires that you have uh, a signed host community agreement in the jurisdiction that you're seeking to operate. So yes, you have to, before, you, before this, the CCC will process your license, they want to know that you've, you've already done all of the work at the local level and you've signed a host community agreement with, um, among other things, but signed a host community agreement okay, with- Okay, so uh, the mayor's office, they do the vetting for the host agreement? Yes. Now, there, some of that is changing. So, um, what you see happening in Boston right now is initially the mayor's office, uh, you know, completely controlled um, what was in the host community agreement. They, they took input um, from community folks. That certainly happened with us, and they, they wanted to hear from people as to what they thought should go into the host community agreement, but it really was the mayor's office signing it. What you see more and more uh, is the involvement of city council. And you know, every municipality, some municipalities have town managers, some have city, city uh, managers and not really sort of a mayoral structure with a city council. But you see more and more local city councils around the state wanting to be directly involved in the negotiation of the host community agreement, which makes some sense because if you're a district councilor, and it's being cited in your district, you're the local elected official who is hearing the most about um, this particular thing and has to sort of answer to their constituents around it. And the host community agreement is um, essentially a series of um, provisions that both sides agree to uh, as to how that operation will function in that location. Sides, the mayor and the person. And the, the operator, okay. and, the, and the operator. So, um, you know, it, it, it contain a variety of different things, and it really has to do with the municipality, what the standards, the community standards are in that municipality, what people want to see. There is um, a standard part of every HCA is a uh, pledge to uh, give 3% of the annual gross revenue, that's before tax revenue, from that operator, um, uh, goes to uh, the municipality. It's a, there's a local excise tax option, so it's, that's how you exercise that, that, uh, that an additional 3%. And the, everybody kind of focuses on that, but we have signed host community agreements that have, have very specific provisions um, based on the community standards um, uh, in that community for anything, some of it's philanthropic work, some of it is um, you know, sort of community work and our, and our willingness to sort of be part of initiatives in that city that are around the community. Um, but there should be a lot, as much input as possible, I think, in host community agreements between um, municipalities, uh, the constituents in those municipalities, and the operator. Okay, one last question. Is there a time limit to get the host agreement in? Uh, I mean, no. Can just say, well, you missed a deadline for submitting your host agreement? I don't think so. I think there is, I think it's, uh, the, way it, the way we've experienced it 
is uh, you start your local permitting, and everybody has a slightly different process, but um, you uh, file the permit, whatever the, the requirements are from the municipality. Uh, you, you're then proceeding, while you're doing all of your community engagement, all of your political engagement, all of that outreach, um, you're probably moving toward some sort of municipal meeting. Like in Boston, you have to have a public community meeting. Um, the HCA is one of, usually is one of the last things that is negotiated um, versus being one of the first things because you want to see how that company is progressing in its permitting process. Are they doing the things you think they should be doing? Are they making the outreach in the neighborhoods they should be making it? Are they responsive to the community? And then you go to the, you usually have um, representatives of the mayor's office or, or uh, the, whatever the local seat of government is at the community meeting to see how the community, what kinds of questions the community is asking and to see how the community is reacting to having this in their neighborhood. And that usually ha holds a lot of sway in terms of whether or not an HCA is, is, is uh, finalized. So my understanding in Brockton, and you can ask your elected official, ask your city councilor, was there any input given to the mayor's office before an HCA was issued? And I think the answer is not much. So what has happened is the HCAs were issued through the mayor's office. Now I'm sure they went through a vetting process, but there was no public input. The, the list came out actually even before the final ordinances were voted on by the city council. So remember, this is an election year. So one of the questions to ask anybody running for mayor or running for city council <coughs> is what was your involvement in the HCAs? How did you give input as to who was getting assigned HCA or not? And then the next question is, how are you going to keep me informed of the opportunity to ask questions of potential marijuana operators. So it's our job to do that. Okay, Nancy, who's next on the list? Kimberly Zuzwa, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question to you is somewhat twofold. How, how would you suggest if there's individuals interested in investing um, in a retail operation or any, any other you know, legitimate cannabis um, operation and what would you suggest to be like the, su the suggested amount to begin to have the impact? In a, in a, an amount f for the that's going to benefit the invest like what amount would yield a, a, a good return or um, what amount is going to be the most helpful in getting that business off the ground? Both. Okay. That's not an easy question. I don't actually know how much would be, it depends on the, how well the business does. Your, the rate of return is largely based on you know, how successful um, you are, which can depend on what kind of license you have. Um, I will say that in order for uh, especially a retail business to get off the ground, the estimates that I've heard are that people need roughly a million dollars to get the, you know, this is to start up the business. That's a lot. Now, there can be large pools of investors who are investing smaller amounts and can sort of do that in a chunk, and then maybe, you know, you go out and you find other investment money. You can have one major investor and, you know, other smaller investors. I don't know if there's a, there's a, there's a, a set way um, that you have to have. I mean, investors invest at all different levels. It largely has to be a conversation between the operators or the potential operators um, and the investors around how that's going to work. Um, because investors, that's a share of the company, and that ultimately goes to the control of the company as well. Um, so those are, those, are, those are serious conversations that definitely need to happen. Um, but it does, I mean, there are... There are, there are smaller businesses, smaller cannabis businesses. There are craft cooperatives. There are micro businesses, uh, people that are cultivating in only 5,000 square feet and are only going to supply, you know, a smaller store. Um, I really can't can't um, 
overstate how important it is to go to the CCC's website and really learn about, if you're interested in being in this business in any capacity, really learning about the variety of licenses that are available, who you can partner with to become involved in the industry, um, especially as an operator, because it takes several people. Um, with, with varying backgrounds, and the other thing that, about cannabis that makes it a little bit more difficult is that because this was a banned substance until recently, it's tough to find people who have specific experience in the cannabis industry. I mean, we all know people who have experience in the cannabis <laughs> industry. It tends not to be that which is put forth on a resume. So, um, which I have to say, on some level, is unfortunate because everybody knows people that know more about this plant and its potential than any of the people that are, that are sort of academically trained experts in it. And, and that really goes to, on some level, the social equity part of it. It's how you get people into the business and how you appreciate whatever their prior experience is um, uh, in the business. There's actually, in the regulations, they encourage people to hire someone with at least one drug conviction. I'm going to have a partnership with the Suffolk County Sheriff and the Sheriff in Franklin County for Athol, where I'm going to be vetting people once they've gone through particular reentry programs and done well in those programs. I'm going to then be looking at them to hire them for a send and hire them in the cultivation. Um, so, I mean, there are different, that's, you know, so those are the things we put, those kinds of things are the things we put in our application. Um, but yeah, companies should definitely be encouraged to, to be uh, creative and think outside the box when it comes to that kind of stuff. But um, to your question about investment, I would, if, if you want to be, um, if you know someone who wants to get into the industry, wants to be a licensee, I mean, you can be a licensee. Right? So you can, you can apply and you can put your name on that license. Um, and you can invest in your own company. You can, you can get a pool of investors, people that you know, to come up with the money to get you started in that business. It's not like you're necessarily going to need a million dollars all at once. But over time, and depending how long it takes you to get through the process of licensing, keep in, you've got to pay the whole fee, um, there are going to be other expenses, you're definitely going to want to draw people to your company that have experience, uh, deep bench in retail is, is, is really important if you're going after a retail license. If you're going after a cultivation license, you've got to have a grower. You've got to have someone who knows how to grow. Um, and cultivation in, in and of itself is a process. And having a place to do that is a, is a process. Um, so it does depend on, you know, where you see yourself in this business. And that's why I keep saying go to the CCC website and find out what the universe of things are that are possible in terms of licensure and then kind of figure out where you can fit into that, how many other people you're going to need to have with you in order to make a meaningful impact or be meaningfully involved in the industry. It is not an easy thing, but it is ultimately worth it. Um, but there is definitely a reason why the majority of businesses are held by um, well-capitalized and predominantly white operators. I mean, the, the two priority licenses that the CCC identified were economic empowerment licenses, which were designed to give people of color uh, a priority review of their license application, and people who had existing medical marijuana facilities. Well, those are well-capitalized businesses that have been up and running for a very long time. They have a site. They have been making a profit. I understand why they were given, to some degree, why they were given a priority, because they had already been vetted by the state. They were a known quantity, a known producer in the state, and, and, and converting them into a recreational facility was not going to be a difficult thing. That said, they cornered a, mar a portion of the market that is now unavailable to everyone else. So, um, and then you have regular um, entrepreneurs in better capitalized businesses, and they do tend to be predominantly led by white males um, because it's an open market. That is what the free market does, right? There's a, there is a new industry that is potentially very, very lucrative. People who are in, want to be in business and want to make money are rushing to that industry. Um, that's why I said sort of looking back in hindsight, um, 
trying to put in place the uh, s something to mitigate the lack of access to capital might have leveled the playing field better than just having the, the language in the regulations. So Nancy, I think we're going to flip to the elected official candidate list now. I think we did our five to one ratio. So do we have anyone on that list? Ed Miller. Okay, who has the mic for Ed? No, I just signed in. Oh, you just signed in. Okay. Is there another person elected candidate list? Yes, we have Jimmy Pereira. Jimmy Pereira. Okay, Jimmy, we'll get a microphone to you. So, Andrea, just so you know, Jim is running for mayor in Brockton. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for this opportunity as well, and thank you for coming out. Thank sure. you, uh, Liz Smith and KPNA, for uh, providing us with this opportunity. Uh, a few questions I have. Uh, uh, and I'll get straight to the point. What if finance is a problem? Because I know that was one of the uh, situations we've seen with the whole city agreements that uh, finance was a barrier. Um, but I want to see what you, uh, what advice you have on that. You mean financing for the company Money. itself? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. If, if an investor wants to um, have a whole city agreement and someone says, well, you don't have any money, then what can they do? It is absolutely true that any municipality that signs a host community agreement is going to be looking for a business that they believe is uh, sustainable right. over time. Right. Uh, in part because of the tax revenue that goes directly to that municipality, mm -hmm. you don't want to have to keep sort of reinventing the wheel and renegotiating new agreements with other businesses because those businesses fold. So financial stability and sustainability is absolutely going to be an issue. Right. Um, you know, how you show that uh, is basically being able to show that you're going to have enough money to, main, to keep your site as your site, mm -hmm. that you're going to have enough money to build it out. Keep in mind that the places that people have, it's not like there are a ton of, if you want to um, uh, put, put a fast food place in where there was a McDonald's, well, it's pretty much built out for you, right? right. There are no pre-built out cannabis operations. Everything that is being leased or purchased has to have a redo. Um, that is construction. That costs money. It's construction on some level, even if it's a relatively minor build out. Restaurants and bars tend to convert most easily to retail. Um, for a lot of it having to do with the customer flow in restaurants and bars is somewhat similar to the customer flow you might have in a retail spot. Um, but you, have to be, you do have to be able to show that. And if you can't sort of show a level of financial solvency um, or enough investor money and a budget that, that sort of will show the municipality that you can, you can sort of do this, you, you, may, you may very well get asked those questions. In the beginning, I don't know that there were a lot of um, financial questions asked in municipalities around this stuff, a lot of sort of a deep dive. But they've been learning, as the operators have been learning, how to actually perfect this process. And that does become an issue um, in certain municipalities, is the sustainability of the business. OK. Uh, if I guess. Uh, okay, we'll do one more, Jimmy, and then we'll switch back. OK. Back to you, okay? OK, thank you. Uh, discussions are starting about the uh, cafes and the uh, uh, cuisine, cuisines and uh, the wheat breweries and things of the sort. Uh, what discussions can the city start having uh, to kind of get it, uh, ahead of the curveball uh, and not be delayed uh, as we've seen the process happen with the recreational marijuana and med medicinal marijuana as well? So I think the, um, the CCC will, f I think they will finalize, if they haven't already, finalize uh, the social consumption and delivery only regulations um, shortly. I keep having to go back to the website because I know that they were originally looking at February and then I think they were looking at March and, I, and they may have finished them. Um, delivery only licenses, uh, which I voted for uh, on the board because I think they do provide a greater opportunity, um, are probably going to be not necessarily easier to get in terms of the comprehensive package that you have to file with the CCC, um, but less onerous operationally, right? So there's, there's a lot of back and forth about whether or not a uh, delivery only a company has to be attached to a brick and mortar store so that you know exactly who it is that you're delivering to. Keep in mind that delivery only extends the seed to sale tracking concern, right? At this point, before delivery, 
it ended at the point of sale because the you were literally handing it to the person who bought it and they were taking it out of the store. Delivery takes that product that is still being tracked and is bringing it, uh, delivering it somewhere. So you have to have some infrastructure. You have to have vehicles that are outfitted the right way. There has to be a vault inside of a van for product. There has to be cameras inside that, that vehicle that are focused on that vault all the time. There has to be GPS tracking of where that vehicle goes. It cannot detour from its, from its path. You need two people in the car. There are, there are you know, discussions about, you know, I don't think uh, delivery only people will necessarily be armed, but what level of security and security training do you need for that? Um, and then you have to have a base of operations where you can be part of the seed to sale tracking mechanism and you can be compliant with the regulations and you're going to have to show the CCC that you're compliant. Um, so you need to be able to video, have video monitoring and GPS tracking of all of your vehicles. So it's not as onerous as a retail license or a cultivation license. Um, but there are still things that you have to comply with. I, I think it's a more accessible license uh, for people. Social consumption even more so, because if you have a, a club or a, a place there, actually people were really surprised about this, but um, there were some places in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that were privately owned spaces that the owner simply said, if you would like to be part of this, you have to pay a membership fee and people were consuming inside in this private space, the same way someone would consume inside a home. That was actually the first, the precursor to social consumption. So just like you can go into a bar and have a drink, there will be places where you can socially consume, and there are lots of discussions about whether or not people, you know, would be able to go to this place, you know, pay a fee to get inside and bring their own, or be sold it when they come inside. The issue for the state around public safety is we kind of have an idea of how alcohol affects people. We look at the proof of what they're drinking and they kind of, you know, that's it. Tons of people, uh, you know, get drunk out of their minds, you know, over an amount that, that probably wouldn't phase somebody else. But trying to figure out what is the level for impairment is the challenge for the state and how you measure that. And if someone leaves a place of social consumption, and that's the last place that they consumed, what's the obligation, just like in a bar where they ask you where's the last place you drank if you get arrested for OUI, um, is there an obligation on the part of the proprietor to make sure people aren't leaving their establishment uh, too impaired to drive? So some of those are the things that are, um, that are being talked about right now, but the social consumption license is literally someone running a business that might uh, also offer food, might just be sort of offering recreational cannabis, that people, the public, can come to and take part. All right, Nancy, we'll go back to the citizen list. Ali Spears. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Brockton. Sure. Um, two questions. Uh, I'm going to go with the first question. So you're saying that the 20% um, of the liquor license. So right now, Brockton has eight licenses. Two of them are going to uh, medical marijuana, so it's supposed to be six licenses. So you're saying that the community, that Brockton, we can, or the mayor, or the city council can issue more licenses if they want to. It's all it's up to the, the city. So we're not stuck on eight. Right. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, the next one, so you're the, the DA. You may have to put it to a oh, vote in all to a vote, the right, exactly, but yeah. yeah. But it's it's not stuck. We're not stuck in mud, right. right? So you being you being the former sheriff, the, the former DA, your, your resume is impressive. Thank you. Um, and you convicted a lot of women and men with can, you know cannabis related. What makes you say that? All right, no, look, all right, let me take it back. The Suffolk the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office convicted people with cannabis related charges right maybe, maybe not you personally so but my, my question is so since you, since you were you're involved in that in that aspect your elected official um, going forward or maybe you might be doing it now but have you talked to other ex politicians retired politicians and say you know what how can we work together and expunge some of these cannabis um, convictions okay I see I know that you said that you're gonna work with the Franklin County and um, Suffolk County to bring people in for jobs, but the next level, are you, are you working on trying to 
um, what's the word, expunge some of those, um, those records? Well, I'm not a prosecutor anymore. I haven't been, I haven't, um, I left uh, Suffolk in 2002. But the reason why I was, I was kind of joking with you about what makes you think that is because I actually started as a prosecutor in 1987 in Middlesex County. And I think I did my last drug case overall in 1991. Was it marijuana? No. Well, and see, it, it does depend on where you were a prosecutor, right? There are some in Suffolk County, straight certainly straight possession of marijuana cases. The in fact, the the statute says that a first offense possession you can't be found guilty. It's the continuance without a finding um, for a period of six months. Um, but there was never a huge priority placed on cannabis offenses either in Middlesex County where I started or in Suffolk County where I did the bulk of my um, career as a prosecutor. Um, but after I left Middlesex County, my focus was uh, exclusively on civil rights cases, domestic violence, sexual assault, that kind of stuff. So I didn't do drug cases at all. Um, but people always assume when they see former prosecutor that I was like in there, you know, doing drug cases all the time. And I had reasons for not doing drug cases anymore. Um, but um, in terms of my involvement on expungement, it's, I just spoke with uh, Naomi Martin. Uh, from the Globe just did a story, it's probably still on the Globe's website, about the difficulty in trying to figure out what to do with these convictions. My perspective on it is that there is certainly a mechanism where people can go in individually and move, not, expungement is different from sealing your record. Expungement is as though the conviction never happened at all, as though, you, you know, it, it doesn't exist. Sealing a record means that people can't see it. Except for law enforcement, you know, employers can't, potential employers can't see it, potential lenders can't see it, all, anybody who would do a background check can't see it. So the argument um, between expungement, the, the argument about expungement right now is whether or not, given the fact that it is now legal and people are making money off of it, should we wipe all of those records clean? I think it's a matter of public policy. I think there needs to be a decision, it needs to be sort of an almost an all or nothing decision. That as a matter of public policy, we decide that they'll either be sealed or they'll be expunged. I think, I do think expungement is a little bit different because people get their records expunged when they have been found to have not, com not committed the crime. The problem is that it was illegal. Uh, even with the caveat that people were wildly, black and brown people wildly over-policed, wildly over-prosecuted for it, it was illegal at the time. I actually went back and looked at what happened to people who were arrested for liquor offenses during Prohibition once Prohibition was lifted and nobody got out, nobody got out of jail and none of their convictions were expunged because the argument was, but it was illegal at the time. And the law changes and you're supposed to conform your behavior to what the law is at the time. What makes it difficult is the element of racism that was involved in the enforcement. And, so, and right, right. The fact that John Boehner is 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 actually you know an investor and on the board is amazing. Um, that's what makes it difficult. I do think that there needs to be it has to be a legislative solution. Individual DAs can make the choice not to prosecute going forward. They can make the choice to not oppose the sealing of a record or an expungement, but that's still a one by one by one proposition. I don't see anything short of a legislative um, decision in much the same way as um, the Supreme Judicial Court made sort of these massive rulings around the cases that Annie Dukin was involved in, the chemist. Um, who had sort of, you know, was sort of not really testing anything and just kind of putting uh, results down. Um, it does have to be, I think, a more holistic. And, and, and the other problem, I'll just say this, the other problem is that in my experience, when uh, cannabis cases were prosecuted, they were usually part and parcel of other cases, right? This also, it also, you know, there's, it's, it's so, it is so complicated in a sense because the odor of cannabis gets you into the car. It gets people out of the car. It gets you to search 
um, that's the that's the probable cause that leads to the other things, right? If you're talking about expunging the conviction, what's how do you what is that that are the other things fruit of a now poisonous tree? Um, see, it's not simple as simple I think as people would like it to be. That said, we tackle tons of difficult things in the United States of America, and we can tackle this and figure out a more equitable solution um, to the to balance the negative impact of these convictions in people's histories um, going forward. Thank you. But even I don't really have all the answers. Yeah. It's it's complicated. Yeah, it All right, Nancy, who's we'll next on? Uh, uh, we have Matt at Dyer. Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, first, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for going on, Jim and Marjorie. I'm always listening to you on WGBH. Thank you. Um, my question is, I'm a selectman down in Hanson, but I'm not really asking as a an elected official, but how do you foresee the relationship between this industry, municipalities, and cities changing down the road? I think, like everything else, people will become accustomed to it. I think in three years, maybe even less, a lot of the anxiety that people have around the uh, existence of a cannabis operation in their neighborhood will dissipate because, and I, and I base that on what has happened in states that where it's been legal a lot longer. Um, there's always sort of this sense of impending doom or the sky is you know, gonna fall if we do a particular thing, only to find out that after we do it that the sky is still there. Um, I also think we <laughs> probably have a lot more to worry about in terms of the future of civilization than whether or not there's a cannabis operation down the street from us. But um, I think that municipalities will um, learn better the kind of relationship they want to have with these retail stores, and also will begin to keep in mind that this is a retail operation like every other retail operation, except it is a highly regulated product. Um, so, the, so the government can't be too onerous on a business, but certainly, you know, especially those that start out in partnership with municipalities, they should continue that. Um, a lot of the things that we get asked about are whether or not, you know, uh, ascend, when I say we, I mean ascend, whether or not we will um, contribute to things like neighborhood cleanups, will, you know, both financially and in terms of personnel, will we, will we contribute to efforts for um, substance abuse education? And it's usually not about cannabis, it's about the other, the opioids and the other kinds of drugs that people are really sort of struggling with. And we always say yes to that. Um, because that's part of a community effort. Those are the, a lot of the things that go into host community agreements or good neighbor agreements with associations that make a company responsive to the community that they are flourishing in, quite frankly, and will make lots of money in. Thank you. Nancy? My next question is uh, Vanessa. Vanessa. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm in economic empowerment, so I've struggled with my process in Brockton. Um, I have two questions for you. I wanted to know um, what are you doing for economic, I mean, not for economic, but for your impact plan, what is it? In addition to um, sort of diverse hiring, so we're, uh, as a CEO, I actually, and it's a startup, I got, I get to build human resources from the ground up, right? So I get to sort of prioritize in our policy, in our employee handbook, even to the, the degree to which we uh, in, uh, offer people benefits. I get to determine how to better make it a, a diverse environment. So the fact that we are, you know, a lot of companies don't offer things like health insurance. They actually pay people on it, sort of a 1099 as consultants to work in cannabis companies health insurance, dental insurance, uh, vision, life insurance, long-term disability, short-term disability, the ability to have those kinds of benefits and then you know, $15 an hour, that widens the pool of people to whom this business is going to be seen as attractive. Having, creating, once you're sort of up and running and you get a sense of how your business flows, creating part-time shifts and flex shifts for single mothers who can't necessarily work full time, but could, and even retirees, but need to make a little bit extra money or paying for medications and things like that. And then attracting people of color into the industry, being very deliberate about um, 
who I attract to ascend and who I hire to ascend in any one of a variety of positions, including managerial, including executive positions. You do have to be, when I was in the sheriff's office, it took, man, um, it was probably over a six year period to very significantly sort of increase the diversity in that um, among corrections officers. So a lot more people of color, a lot more women, but also it's the promotional process. It's how you're allowing people to move up and through your business, right? So most people are going to, are going to start sort of at the, at the sort of retail level or at the cultivation level. But you can find people who can be managers. Being a retail cannabis store manager, first of all, there's a huge amount of responsibility in that job. And it pays well. You have to make sure that the people that are working um, under you are compliant with the CCC's regulations. That's how you lose your license. When somebody's asleep on the job, you need really good managers for that. Those are great ways to get into the industry and then to sort of move up um, um, through the industry. So there's that aspect, of, there's sort of the diversity plan aspect of, of what we want to do um, with Ascend. But then in terms of um, when you talk about an area of disproportionate impact, so there's the, there's the agreements with the, the sheriff's offices um, and the way that we're going to hire. But one of the other things I, I want to do, and we're in the process of filing um, for our nonprofit status now, is to create a separate independent nonprofit. It's called the We Grow Foundation. It's great to give people an opportunity by giving them a job. But if you're talking about an area of disproportionate impact, you're talking about a widespread generational impact. You're talking about chronic unemployability based on a quarry, right? Which has an impact on the individual, which has an impact on that individual's family, especially on that person's children. And you're talking about communities where a nonprofit that has the ability to grant, to provide grants that can be funded, in, from, in, from my perspective, can be funded by cannabis retail revenues, right? I'm still kind of waiting for an answer on that from the IRS, but um, even if it's funded in a separate account and clearly it's not tax deductible um, because of the federal prohibition, small businesses are the backbone of every single community, especially in communities of color, barbershops, nail salons, just small businesses that local people go to that keeps uh, the local economy going. When the economy is good, and right now people are saying that it's good, I think that's a little bit illusory, but people are saying it's good. Banks tend to fold up their portfolios for small business loans, because why take the risk? Loaning to smaller businesses, which have a higher risk of failure, is inherently risky for a bank. So they don't necessarily have to give out the money they're thriving in other areas. Why bother? Among the ideas I have for this for a nonprofit is why can't a not-for-profit partner with a bank to underwrite some of these loans or subsidize them in some way that removes some of the risk for the bank, right? Because it's a grant that's coming from the nonprofit that's added to whatever the bank would loan. A $50,000 loan is the difference between existence and non-existence for a small community business, which puts money back into that community. I'm trying to be as creative as possible in creating a not-for-profit that can not only help service providers in the community who provide services to children of incarcerated parents, the Girl Scouts, right, um, or, or provide social services. These are smaller uh, service providers that don't have the money to hire a big development person to throw a gala once a year and raise a half a million dollars or, or, or a quarter of a million dollars. They live and die by small appropriations and donations, and if they're lucky, a small line item from the state. A not-for-profit that is specifically seeking out those service providers and helping small businesses, that to me is how you have a generational impact commensurate with the negative generational impact that was caused by the war on people who use drugs. That's how I think companies should be creative about how, and this, this is a foundation that Ascend wouldn't run. It would have an independent board and an independent executive director, an independent president and CEO, but its mission would be to seek out that particularized level of need and help to mitigate um, the negative generational impact um, that has been experienced over many years' time 
um, with the help of some grants and some, and I, and I think that, I think those are the kinds of things that companies have to be looking at. Um, and, if, and if a door gets closed and somehow you can't have that nonprofit because you can't fund it with that kind of money, then you find another way to do it. But you can find a way to channel those resources where they're most needed. Um, I just want to tell you that I'm in the process of, well, I'm talking to the mayor's office in Brockton of getting my host agreement, and your plan is like kind of like my plan, so I was wondering if we could like talk later about sure. avenues. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. That's great. Sure. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I see Willie is waving his um, well, we spatula we at us. Spatula. I, I, I didn't have to because every single question was on the two Good. So if we did not get to you in your question, I'm sure Andrea will stay for a few minutes. Please feel free to come up. But I do first want to thank Pastor Riggins. Where's Pastor Riggins and Messiah Baptist for the meeting space tonight? Thank you. I'd also love to thank our Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association volunteers, to Nancy and to Mr. Wilson for their help. To every one of you, I know that there are things like the Celtics game that's starting fairly soon, but to come out tonight and learn to be empowered learn to ask the questions, learn to ask elected officials. You know, the, the industry is here, it's legal, we have to learn to live with it. How can we be good neighbors, responsible corporate citizens, as Andrea said. And I want to thank you, the CEO of Ascend uh, Wellness. You've shared a lot. Ascend, Ascend Mass. Mass. I know you changed the name. It, it, it kind of <laughs> threw me, Ascend Mass. Um, but I think your honesty, your directness, your depth of knowledge of the industry and sharing that with us and coming down to Brockton is truly appreciated. So we'll give her a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.